I'm going to talk about demonstrative evidence, and I appreciate everyone staying. Hopefully, I can make this a little more, um, uh, make it quick and interesting so that we can um, end the day uh, on something a little more hands on. Demonstrative evidence is um, real and illustrative evidence. Real meaning it actually had to do with the scene of the accident. Here's the fender, here's the light. Um, or illustrative, uh, here is a, a uh, diagram of the scene of the accident. And uh, it's so important because while test, trial testimony is most of what we do, right? We ask questions, they give answers, the other side asks questions, they give answers. That's the trial. 11% of people are auditory learners. So that's great. We have one out of 10 or one out of nine of our, of our uh, jurors hooked in with that. 83% of people are visual learners, all right? And so we have to use and rely on visual aids to tell the story. I mean, what's the old adage? A picture's worth a thousand words. Um, we have to be able to do that. And there are many different ways to do that. If we are showing how somebody does a particular task. We do a lot of railroad stuff. You talk about throwing a switch. and You can say, oh, you, you, you stand with your shoulders uh, or your feet shoulder width, width apart. You approach the, the switch. You bend down at your knees, careful to you know, lift it up and not use excessive force. You can talk about it all day long. But if nobody's ever seen someone throw a railroad switch, the picture's worth a thousand words. Here's the guy taking the switch down from here and over to the other side. That's part of the job. And what we'll use this for a lot is with physicians to say, um, hey, doctor, do you really think this guy can go back and do this kind of work? And we have pictures of guys climbing on the side of rail cars or carrying knuckles or lacing hoses and doing things that you can talk about. But until you see someone doing it, you go, oh, well, that does look like physical work. And he is outside, and he is walking on big rocks, ballast. And uh, it helps bring, bring testimony and words to life. We do it again with medical illustrations. You can have doctors come in and say a lot of big words in medical testimony about what they do. But if you have a picture, you can show the jury. And the doctor can describe and say, this is great. Doctors usually like these. Is this a fair representation? Yes, it is. Tell us what you did. We went in here, and I did this. We'll explain this. And they'll tell you exactly what they did. And you can actually now visualize these big words, um, even like incision and bone graft and iliac crest. What the hell does that mean? And this can show you exactly what that means. It's that and there with that thing. You know, and so it helps you tell your story. Um, medical illustrations, someone was talking to you earlier, you can get some generic ones off the internet that work fine. We have some generic ones at the office we use over and over. Hundred dollars maybe. You can get custom made ones, six hundred up to a thousand. Um, demonstrative evidence doesn't always have to be about spending the most money. But you do have to get your pictures and your real and illustrative evidence out there to the jury so they can see it. Um, if you have a case where there's been a, we'll go back to our train analogy, there's been a derailment of the train. And it shears off 10 bolts. Well, what does that mean? Well, bring in the bolts and show how big they are. And imagine you know, 10 of these being sheared off. It's a lot more important when you can feel, hear, see how big these things are. Um, and the biggest thing um, that you want to do is you want to help the jury see what you're talking about. I recently, I say recently, I guess it's almost been a year, tried an um, auto case. And I got a magnet board and matchbox cars, and we put lanes of traffic on it, and it was a $75, uh, $75 demonstrative piece of evidence that could show the jury exactly what these cars were doing. Instead of me saying, when car one was driving southbound on Georgia 400 and was slowing for vehicle number three and the second lane from the right, the, the cars are there, and they can actually see, it, see you doing it. Um, and again, that helps our 83% of visual learners see what we're talking about. We've got a case involving a brake stick. <coughs> Has anyone ever seen a brake stick before? A brake stick is used to apply handbrakes by railroad workers. And what they do, to make sure I'm doing this the right way, is they extend this out. And instead of climbing on top of a rail car, 
they take it and they take the brake wheel, do it around, and then they pull it like this. So they don't have to get up on the, 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 the uh, back of a car. And the railroads like this because then people aren't falling off the back of cars and getting hurt. Well, my guy was working the rail yard, second car of the day, he's operating the brake stick, and lo and behold, it breaks in half. This part here breaks off from this part here, <coughs> right here at the last notch. Well, I read about it, I saw pictures of it, and, uh, you know, felt like I really needed to order one. And here's where it came in handy, and here's where it will come in handy to show the jury. They're blaming him for not properly inspecting the brake stick. Well, he should have known there was stress fractures in the last notch. If he had done a proper inspection as required by our rules, then he would have seen it and this never would have happened. The problem, and I didn't learn this until we got it, is it doesn't come out any further than this. This is as far as it comes out. He was in the last notch. So it is certainly impossible to try to inspect something that you can't see. And unless I had bought the brake stick, looked at it, and, um, and tried to do it, I might have actually believed, oh crap, we've got a problem, the guy didn't properly inspect it. But it doesn't come out any further. He couldn't have inspected it. Um, and it's what we call virtually eliminating reality. You cannot virtually eliminate reality or you will be virtually eliminated. Go to the accident scene. Take pictures. Use things like Google Earth, Google Maps. Um, you can use property plots and plats that are um, a lot of times with the uh, county government ha has those online and they are cheap and easy ways in order to do uh, in, in order to show the jury uh, what you're trying to tell them. Now on the more expensive end of demonstrative evidence, we have, as the train plays I think in the background, uh, the horn, let me see, there we go. Um, you can do computer illustrations. Has anyone in here used a computer illustration in a case? One, two, maybe two. They can be very effective, but they are very expensive. Um, and it's not something you can use in every case. We had a case uh, against the railroad, and I could tell you about it, how there was a double track, and there was a crossing, and it had bells and lights. And what had happened is we believed the railroad had left a cut of cars I mean several cars parked too close to the crossing, which kept the bells and lights of the crossing indicators, you've all seen it, some have arms, some don't, going off all the time because it was too close, so the indicator was always set off. So it's kind of like crying wolf. Everyone sees they're going off all the time because the railroad parks them too close, and um, you tend to start to ignore that or warning. The other thing it did is it blocked the far tracks from being able to see what was coming. Um, and let's see if this aerial view works. Uh, is it doing that? Hold on. It's mirroring my drives. Let me turn off mirroring. Um, the other thing it helps us do is to, um, is to show the jury something we would not be able to show them otherwise, which is, let me see here, displays. I'll turn off my mirroring. There we go. There we go. Um, it will help us show them what we otherwise couldn't tell them. If you all see here, I'll come over to this side. Here's the cut of cars we were talking about that was blocking. Here's our car coming. And here's the train that hits it. All right? The railroad denied that that happened. We didn't have that cut of cars there. We never parked that cut of cars there. Um, what you just showed in, in this uh, fancy animation just isn't the reality. And again, you see how important this is that if our lady's coming up here and there's a bunch of cars here, then it is blocking her view of the train. And it also, because it's parked so close, the lights are going off, as they did all the time, and she didn't think there was a train coming. Well, luckily, 
the state patrol had taken some pictures before the railroad got out there and moved the cars away from where they were. And what we were able to do through technology is to show that this was not one line of cars. You see the ambulance there. They, would, they argue that this is just one line of cars. This is actually kind of hard to see up here. But you'll see as you fade out the other cars that are in the closed track, you get to the second track, and you can see the second kind of cars fade in to where they were on the position based on the pictures that we got from the police department. Um, that was the case. And as you see, as we turn it around here, That is exactly what blocked our client's view when she was going across the crossing that day. Is it expensive? Absolutely. Um, are these people sometimes frustrating to work with? Yes. Um, do, they have, do they have anything riding on the case? No, they get paid either way. But that's how experts are. Um, courts are very receptive to this kind of evidence. Um, it, it used to be, I think, the first reported decision on computer animations was maybe 1972, and we cited that in the paper. It is very, very commonplace now, and it should not be very difficult to get this kind of evidence in. Um, but understand that demonstrative evidence is not going out with the jury. It is to demonstrate your idea and to show the jury um, exactly your story. Your, you will tell your story through opening and closings. You will tell your story through witnesses. Um, but you have to show your story at some point. And a very good way to do it, and again, it is a lot of times cost prohibitive, but a very, very good way to do that is through something like this. Uh, the same people who did the animation also took a car and drove the route that our lady drove that day, our client, to show exactly how it looks, how it felt to her, how she saw it that day. And again, it's a very good lesson on us not virtually uh, eliminating reality. Go out and do the inspection. Take pictures of what you see. Um, you can take picture files now. You can upload them to uh, FedEx Kinkos. They can print them out, and they are relatively inexpensive. You can do it with documents. You can do blow-ups with simple programs like Acrobat. Um, and it, it is incredibly effective to not only say, well, the contract required this in Section 5.1, but to show it and to highlight it. We just had a motion for summary judgment uh, that we argued the other day, and this is her going across those double tracks, um, where we blew up uh, the important parts of the defendant's investigation for, uh, for our oral argument because, again, judges, like human beings, 83% of them are going to be visual and not auditory learners, and it can help them, too. Um, Again, there are, we, we also do a presentation on how you can do inexpensive ones. You can borrow things. You can check out books from the library. Um, there are a lot of used books and illustrations. We recently had a medical malpractice case that we resolved, but um, I'd ordered a medical illustrations book from Amazon. It was used, and it was like 30 bucks. Um, so so these, these resources don't have to be expensive. Not everyone has a spine in their office to show the doctor what a herniated disc looks like. But everyone can buy a, a stack of jelly donuts and can stack them on top of each other and show how it compresses or what a herniation is to illustrate kind of how the back works. It's cheap, it's easy, and you know what? A lot of times it's interesting because a lot like today, you hear a lot of people talking. Um, they're saying very interesting things that are very valuable to our practices, but at some point, uh, it's very difficult not to zone out. Um, so your jurors are the same way. They're even less interested. They don't need to get CLE hours. And they're not there for something that has anything to do with their practices. So try to make it interesting. You don't have to always outspend the other side. Um, but be creative and be interesting. And the judges, I think, appreciate it too. Um, if, are there any questions about demonstrative evidence? I want to mention a couple of things before we got done, finished. Um, Tony Davis spoke this morning about motions in limine, and we spoke afterwards, and she wanted me to mention this. 
The rule that you don't have to uh, renew your objection if your motion in limine has been granted, it's not waived, that's only true in state court. In federal court, if your motion in limine has been granted, um, you have to object, even if it's been granted, when they have to bring up that evidence, or you will have waived it. And that is an ugly place to be. Um, federal and state rules were very similar and getting more similar uh, with, has the evidence code been adopted yet? No. Will be. We're going to get a new evidence code. It's going to mirror the federal rules. Um, but there are still significant differences like that. Um, so I wanted to mention that.